Good. How you been, Al? Ah, uh, not too bad. Good. Kind of staying quarantined, ready to go fishing. All right. We're going to talk about that because we got some opportunities coming up. And uh, I think we'll jump into it here. It's a quarter after seven, and uh, I don't see anybody in the waiting room. So I'm going to share my screen and uh, go over some, some things from National. Uh, there is some news, as I said in my uh, email, we have got some, uh, some news coming up. And you should be able to see my screen at this point. Yep. You can see that? Ooh, Good. Yeah. All right. Um, so we'll go over this stuff and then we'll jump into a couple of other subjects. And uh, so this part of the presentation is very much the same as what you have already seen if you saw the last one. I've just updated it with uh, the most current information, which came in a couple of days ago. Okay. Uh, come on, next. There we go. Uh, again, we're going to go through a little bit of phase two, the description and the timing. Um, the full implementation of that continues. We're still in phase two, and we are now in phase three. And we'll talk about the differences between those. Just because phase three has um, kicked off, it does not mean that phase two goes away completely. Okay. All right, I wanted to go over the requirements again because, and I'm gonna go through this quickly, because the requirements for phase three are virtually identical to those from phase two. Um, and again, we have to comply with all the healing waters, the federal and the state uh, COVID restrictions. Positivity uh, test results must be less than 5% for seven day rolling average. Uh, headquarters has to review all of the outings and must approve of them. Uh, can't have any more than one healing activity at, at each location at the same time. You must have an active status in CRM. Uh, you must have completed the COVID-19 waiver again in CRM. And the COVID-19 questionnaire has to be completed for each event. Uh, apparently they are updating the questionnaire. I just saw something about that not 20 minutes ago. And uh, the updates will have to do with any pre-existing conditions that are not related to COVID. And I have not seen the questionnaire, but I wonder about what kind of questions they're going to be asking. I'm not sure that that will float with HIPAA requirements. So we'll have to see what the new questionnaire looks like, uh, but I understand that's supposed to be coming very soon. Uh, volunteers only have to complete a training program uh, for conducting the outdoor core programs. Uh, you have to wear a face mask, eye protection, uh, and adhere to the sanitation policies. Eye protection can be as simple as sunglasses. You don't have to wear goggles or anything like that, just your regular sunglasses or prescription glasses, whatever you may wear, as long as there's something over your eyes, okay? Uh, maintain the six foot minimum, provide your own transportation, no carpooling is permitted, and the location must be within a hundred mile radius of home. Uh, and that is for both volunteers and veterans. Um, I have asked them to expand that significantly because a hundred mile radius is not gonna cut it for us come summertime, okay? Um, they told me they would address it, but they haven't as of yet. 
Okay. Uh, you have to provide your own food and drinks, no sharing, no sharing of equipment. Uh, but if you need gear, it will be provided. We have uh, donated equipment that uh, we can provide you with, or we can use some of the healing waters equipment. Okay. Got to follow all laws for PFDs. Uh, volunteers may not fish during the healing event. All events must be scheduled and approved through CRM, like I said before, at least two business days prior to the event. That may be changing to three business days, but I haven't seen it officially. Again, the location less than 100 miles, medium to low risk locations. The definition of that is so big, it's not worth talking about. Uh, and the event leader must conduct uh, pre-activity, activity, and post-activity post procedures. No overnight or indoor activities are authorized at this time. So that's just a quick review of those fun things. Um, phase three is called a multiple participant outdoor healing gathering. Uh, up to 10 veterans and volunteers, and it can be any mix of the two, but the total number has to be 10 or less. Uh, all the requirements and restrictions, as I say, are identical to phase two. And it became official and was implemented across the country on April 19th, namely yesterday. And we were told about it on Friday night. So we've had lots of time to plan. Uh, there is no end date stipulated. And phase four and phase five activities are still currently listed for 2022. However, I'm hearing rumors that it may be sooner. Okay. Uh, big, bold statement. If you are not comfortable participating in a group activity like phase three, you can still request a phase two one-on-one -on -one type of activity. The uh, reason why I'm putting this out to everybody is that we have some people that uh, either will not or cannot get vaccinated, are uncomfortable with being in a group setting. And if so, that doesn't mean that they're completely out of the program, okay? Uh, we will still work with you to try and get a one-on-one -on -one type of activity uh, at your request, okay? So I want to make sure that everybody realizes that we're not trying to uh, isolate anybody or keep anybody out. Got one more person coming in. That's Jim Mack. Jim, good to see you. So there's some additional information that has just come out. And I'm going to read some of this to you because these are direct quotes. Uh, they came in, uh, as I say, on Friday on the 15th uh, from David Folkert, who is the chief operating officer of Project Healing Waters now. Uh, which means he's the, the second banana, if you will. Uh, and his, um, his comment was, please remember that the initial requirements and restrictions currently in place for phase three are temporary. They will adjust or change over time to be less restrictive. And that is the sum total of that statement. I have no idea what he's talking about. There's no specifics. I'm hoping he's referring at least to the 100-mile um, radius. And then also on the subject of the COVID vaccination, uh, he says this is not and never was a requirement for participation in phase two or three. And it will not be a requirement later on for participation in phase four or phase five activities or outings. Okay, so we've got um, those two statements. So this, there was some concern about the vaccination. Um, some of the previous documentation said that uh, moving to phase four and five would require vaccination. 
where there would be some statement about it. So that is not going to be the case now. So that is good news. Now for three, uh, for phase three, we're looking at locations, um, some of which are in the valley, some of which are just outside of the valley, but they fall into two categories. One is within the 100 mile radius. So we've got uh, Ocotillo Lakes uh, that stand in Sun Lakes and the Sun Lakes Fly Fishing Club is working on putting together an outing for us down there. Um, Fane Lake in the Prescott area is within the 100 mile limit. Uh, Goldwater Lake, same thing. Green Valley Lakes in Payson is within the limit, depending upon where you are in the valley. If you're in the far west valley, it may be like 104 miles or something. If that's the case, we have been told that they would approve it if it's just a little bit over the 100 mile limit. Uh, and then also the Gila River near PIR. Uh, Bill is very familiar with that area, and that might be a possibility. And Bill is also working on getting approval for us to use the uh, facility at Biscuit Tank up on the uh, fish and game property up at Ben Avery. And he is working on uh, getting that approval. So that's good. So we have a number of things that we're looking at right now. We're trying to figure out which ones are going to be the most practical and uh, what the timing is going to be like. And on those, we need to, especially those that are um, in town, like Acatillo Lakes, um, and of course, there's all the other uh, you know, urban fisheries that we can access. Uh, we'll have to do it pretty quick because things are going to get pretty warm pretty fast. Okay. Then beyond the 100 mile radius, uh, if and when that's approved, uh, Den Horse Ranch Lagoons and the very river uh, in Cottonwood are a possibility. Willow Springs and Woods Canyon, again, a possibility, or the Earth East Verde River in Payson is another possibility. And suggestions are welcome. We have, uh, <clears throat> You know, lots of people with good ideas and we just need to hear, hear them. And uh, then we'll go out and do some fishing. Uh, on all of these, I would make sure that you keep an eye peeled on your email because all of the invitations are going to come through email. Um, it's really difficult to schedule these things through CRM because we're, we're gonna put the invitation out to everyone that's in the program, um, which means that if we, if we do that through CRM, there's gonna be 126 emails going out. And it will be based on the reply to the emails as to who gets on to the trips. If we have something that's very popular and we get more than 10 people, um, then we're going to go by first come, first served. Okay. And if we go well beyond the 10, we'll schedule a second trip to the same location. Okay. It's possible, depending upon where we're going, if we wanted to, we could have a an outing, for instance, uh, Bill and I had talked about uh, Biscuit Tank, we could have a group in the morning and a group in the afternoon, and that we can do. But we'd have to, uh, you know, have enough people for both, okay? Uh, so again, watch your email and uh, respond as soon as you can, and we'll get you, uh, I'm gonna do it on the ones, I'll send it out two ways. It'll go out through CRM because it, it needs to, Okay, and I will also follow that up with a regular email that comes from me so that we, we don't have a lot of confusion with the CRM issues. Okay, um, so that's the story on that. And the last line down the bottom there, it says some locations may require water certs. 
And there's more to come on that. We've got to figure out how we're going to handle water certifications. And Norm, did you want to jump in at this point and talk about that for a minute? No, just that uh, the pool's still pretty cold. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and that's, uh, you know, that's rule one. Uh, the other is, it's, it will be very difficult to follow the letter of the law on the social distancing and the mask thing. Uh, and uh, talking to Rich the other day, he pointed out that if you wear a mask and it gets wet, that's sort of like waterboarding. And it's probably not in the program anywhere. <laughs> so, so we're going to work on it. We are working on this. Uh, we'll see. We'll, what we'll probably do is probably crash the volunteers through first. So we have a pool, pardon the pun, uh, that we can draw from for volunteers and then uh, and then work on, on getting other folks in. So that's my story. So we'll yeah. let you know as, as we get along here. Yep. Yeah, good. Okay. So questions or comments about all that good stuff? Rich, yeah, Mike. I, I have a two part question. Okay. Um, being a Marine, you know that I will never ever bend rules. <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah. So having said that, <laughs> For instance, for myself, I'm seriously planning on going up to the Sholo area in the beginning of the May time frame. Okay. And if I'm going to stay up there in a couple of days, one, and I'm not asking you to answer that now. I'm asking you to answer this question later in an email, perhaps. But if I'm going to go up there for a couple of days, well, then could that perhaps reset the 100 mile radius. Two, my second question is, <clears throat> is what about collaboration? If we collaborated with the Southern, um, on it, and I think the guys out of Sholo might be the Southern Colorado guys, what would happen if we did a collaboration and we said, okay, well, if we collaborated with some guys up in Sholo, would that reset the 100 mile radius? Um, I can answer that for both parts of the question for you, as a matter of fact, actually three parts to that. First of all, I've never heard of a Marine that broke a law or a rule. I've never heard such, such a thing. Okay. Yeah, but once a Marine, always a Marine. Obviously, the mic fits. Simplify. Okay. Secondly, I don't. If someone had, for instance, a summer home in Sholo and they were going to spend, say, six months there, then I think you could make an argument for the hundred mile radius from there. Okay. Um, but for just a short period of time, I don't think so. Okay. Um, the guy that is running the Healing Waters program, such as it is in Sholo, his name is Kevin Widner. And we've, uh, we've worked with him on a couple of occasions when we've had uh, trips up to the Sholo area, Big Lake specifically. Um, they still have a functional program up there. And, but it is barely breathing. It, I think, is on life support. Uh, they're having a hard time. Now, having said all of that, there is absolutely nothing to be said about people that want to get together and go fishing in Sholo as friends. It would not be a Healing Waters event. It'd just be people getting together and going fishing. And I won't say a whole lot more about that than that, <laughs> except I'm, I'm planting a seed for you. And if there were a number of people that just happened to get together and stumble upon one another, say it's Silver Creek, wouldn't that be a shame? 
I wonder how that happens. I'll be there tomorrow. <laughs> is, does that well, sort of answer your question, Mike? Uh, yes, it does. As a matter of fact, I'll put it to everybody right now that I've already made reservations at the Days Inn on September 29th, 30th, and October 1st, 2021. <laughs> I'm just saying. Just saying, right? If you have to show up. Oh, well. Mm, interesting. Uh, I would not expect that there will be a uh, any kind of formal events during that time period like we've had in the past. Um, I happened to have lunch with uh, Ken McGowan a week or so ago. You know that he has retired from uh, that program and uh, from fishing game. And, uh, you know, Bill and myself and a couple of others uh, took him to lunch. And uh, he was saying that he did not expect uh, at that point that there was going to be anything going on. However, that could change. But with the moratorium on overnight trips with healing waters, I don't think we're going to see that disappear before the end of September. And that's just a gut feeling. And so I, I don't think there's going to be anything formal going on. But doesn't mean there won't be some good fishing on that river. I, I did the trip last year. I, I went up there September 30th and October 1st, 2020. Mm -hmm. And I did stay at the Days Inn. And um, I really did. I have a wonderful time. I only went up there. Um, I was only able to hike in from the lower part of the river to the upper part, and I was able to catch a fish, loved it, had a great time. I wasn't able to stay for a long time, and I had to make sure that I got out in time, um, but I had a great, it, it was great, and it would have been wonderful if I could have met, you know, a couple people up there. We went in together. Just saying. I agree, yes. And, you know, also from the safety standpoint, uh, having another person with you is always a good idea. I made the same hike uh, myself this past summer when I was up there and uh, hiked all the way up to the, where the fence is that isolates the, uh, uh, you know, the trophy water. Uh, it's a beautiful hike. I had a, a great time, fished it all the way up and back and you know, I uh, really enjoyed myself, but did not see another person once I left, like the second bend, you know, <laughs> where the big tree is on, the, you know, just up, upstream from the bridge. Okay. Beyond that, there wasn't anybody there. But, but I'll have, have no illusions. On October 1st, I went up there at daybreak and I hiked in, um, but I will say probably about, you know, Eight o'clock, nine o'clock in the morning. Um, it was there were people there, you know, and they were there with their music loud and laughing and joking and every ten meters, fifteen meters. So yeah, get up nice early, place. enjoy it, and get out. Yep. Uh, Ken was saying that they uh, last year they restricted it to forty-three vehicles on the property. And uh, there were cars backed up out on the main road uh, for quite some distance um, by seven o'clock in the morning. There were some people that got out there and got in line at midnight the night before and slept in their cars and trucks. It's that popular a <laughs> event. So, uh, yep. But as they say for Sholo, if a uh, few people happen to get together, geez. What a shot. What a surprise. <laughs> All right. Other comments, questions, et cetera? Uh, I had a quick question for you, Rich. Yeah. Um, you had mentioned that invitations for outings would be sent out via CRM. Is the response supposed to be through CRM too, or is it just the response to that? and the email that you send out personally? 
It should be to both. Okay. Okay. Um, for one thing, CRM records, it, if you get the email that says, hey, there's going to be an outing, and this is what it's called, um, I will try and be descriptive in the title because there is almost no space to put any detailed information in the email that goes out. And that's the reason for the second email. So when you get the email from CRM, you want to respond to it that if you want to go, that you want to sign up to go, OK, uh, and send that back. That actually puts a number next to the response. So we'll know the sequence of responses of who's first, second, third, et cetera. And the ones that come back to me via email, I will do the same thing, but it'll be based on the date and time that it shows up in my inbox. Okay. Theoretically, they should both be pretty close. <laughs> All right. Um, and we'll do the best we can to be fair about it. Um, I know it's kind of a kludgy thing to have to do it twice. But as I say, there's a, a set number of characters that's allowed in the description field, and it's very small. It's, it's like 50 characters. So we can't hardly put any description of the event in there. Okay. We, we certainly have 50 characters in this program. Come on. <laughs> well, you know, you're right. <laughs> yeah. Again, it's, with well excess, it's well in excess of 50. And some of them have two. <laughs> so, so that's, uh, you know, we're going to do the best we can with it. Hopefully some of the things that, um, you know, David's talking about that he says that we're going to be making some changes will simplify this whole process. Um, I'm wondering how the new regional coordinators are going to handle all of this with some 220 programs in the country that are all going to be, let's assume that they all want to do one of these outings a month with 10 people. Okay, they're going to be inundated. And I don't know how they're going to manage to keep up with it. They were having a hard time keeping up with uh, just the trial period for phase two. So hire more, Mitch. That's probably the answer, yeah. <laughs> and then all we have to do is get them trained. <laughs> so, yes, Mike? No, no, I'm volunteering. Oh, okay. <laughs> so we'll, we'll see how it all goes. It and as John, as Norm will tell you, I'm untrainable. <laughs> <laughs> I don't believe that, Ed. <laughs> Come on, Mayor. <laughs> well, Sam's in the Christmas picnic. Ed. Thank your pardon, sir. Salmon at the Christmas picnic. What about it? Let's do it. Oh, my word. We got to do a better <laughs> job of it. <laughs> All right. Burned yeah. and raw were, the, were not good. <laughs> You're uh, practice. <laughs> that was practice. <laughs> but it definitely was good. There's no question about it. That's a fact. I'm going to bring in an expert to help with the cooking side of it, better known as Kathy in my better half. <laughs> Actually, I, if I were you, I'd tap Jet because she's smiling at the, at the thought there. Oh, yeah? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Did oh, I yeah. hear a yes? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, hopefully it'll be fish that we all catch, right? Wouldn't that be sweet? Mm. All right. Um, just want to check one thing here. Okay. Um, if there aren't any more questions or comments, then we'll jump into our program tonight, which is going to be given by Mary, and she's going to tell us all about flies. So you're ready, Mary? 
I guess I'm ready. All right, go for it. Okay, let me get my screen up here. All righty, can everybody see that? Yep. All right, can everybody hear me? <laughs> yeah. What? What? <laughs> <laughs> Damn Marines. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, well, we're going to talk about flies tonight. Um, so I call this uh, talk, Why That Fly? Round two. Round two, because we've given this talk once before and uh, nobody threw stones at me. So I figure we'll talk about it again. Um, I did throw some, put some new stuff in here though. So if you have seen this before, there is a little bit of new stuff in here, um, specifically. We are going to be uh, throwing in some information about uh, entomology, some basic entomology information. Um, so for those that are not sure what that big word is, it is the study of the life cycle of insects. Um, unfortunately or fortunately, um, if you are a fly fisherman, you are probably going to at some point pick up a little bit about entomology just because you kind of have to just to understand the terminology and the phrases that are being thrown around. Um, so we'll go over um, some of the more base or the more common um, subsections of, of uh, insects and then we'll kind of go over uh, what some of the dry flies are, kind of how to fish them, nymphs, emergers, same thing, what they are, how to fish them, midges, streamers, terrestrials, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the ways that you would fish some of these lovely flies, um, two fly rigs, and then various other things to kind of think about when you're on the water and you're not having any luck with what you got on your line, so let's talk and try something different. Um, and then uh, one of the last slides is going to be a list of common uh, flies of the different subsects, subsections um, that we would use in Arizona. So that's the plan. Hopefully I don't put anybody to sleep. Um, items that we're kind of kind of talk about with each type of fly is the types of water um, that you would fish them on and why you would fish them on that particular type of water, how you would fish them and why, um, how long to stay with that fly and why you would want to change if needed. Um, my basic rule of thumb on this is if it's working, keep using it. Um, but if it's you know not working or you're not getting any bites or you're not even getting fish to look at it, um, well, then it's time to maybe try something different, either a different depth or a different fly, or maybe change up your stripping techniques. Um, you know, just something's not working, so try and change something. So that's what we're going to kind of talk about. All right, entomology. Uh, life cycles of these different four, there's kind of four major um, types of flies that we use in fly fishing. There's mayflies, there's caddisflies, there's midges. Midges are also called coronamids. If you've ever heard that big word thrown out, that's what they're talking about. And then there's stoneflies. Now stoneflies we don't really see a whole lot of here in Arizona, um, but they are, uh, if you go fishing in say Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, um, some of the other, you know, uh, western states, northern western states, you're probably going to maybe run across some stoneflies. Um, so it never hurts to at least have a general idea of what they are and what they look like and why you would fish this one versus that one. Um, so that little picture over on the right side of the screen um, is kind of what those of those four different subset or you know sec subsects of insects, that's a hard word to say, um, the you know, so what we're trying to mimic the nymphs, the emergers, and then the dry the dry flies. Um, so we've got mayflies on the top, caddisflies on the second line, midges on the third, and then stoneflies on the, the fourth. So we shall start with the mayflies. Uh, mayflies are one of our 
primary uh, fly types that we will use um, when fishing or fly fishing. Um, they go through, I'm sorry about the fuzziness of that picture. When I tried to blow it up, it kind of went all fuzzy on me, but hopefully you can at least get profiles and kind of see them. Um, so over on the left side, uh, there's a number one. That's actually an adult or a spinner, um, as they are termed, laying uh, eggs on the water. So those eggs will uh, filter through the water and they'll eventually deposit on the bottom. And um, from there, they will, the eggs will hatch and eventually they will, you know, be a nymph form. Um, and that nymph is going to work its way up from the bottom of the water in the, in the you know, substrate that's down there and work its way up to the surface. And when it's getting towards the surface, it's, surface, it's referred to as an emerger. Um, now with the mayflies, once they've actually popped onto the surface, um, they go through a, a state that's called, um, it, it's, sort, it's, it's referred to as a, being a dun, D-U-N, um, and it's this middle phase between nymph emerger and flying adult. It's a point where they're on the surface, their wings are spread out um, and they're just kind of getting that final development of their wings before they fly off. It's also a phase where um, the fly is actually particularly vulnerable because they're not really able to move, move off the water yet and fish will be when they're you know hitting on the surface they're they're most likely hitting some sort of a newly emerged adult or a dun. Once that dun um, finally gets its wings into a for, into a state where it can actually take off the take off into the air, um, it kind of goes. It's this molting process, and then from that point, they are then called spinners. Um, so if you've ever heard of, of a fly that's termed as a spinner, well, it's, it's a mayfly that has, you know, actually is actually in a flyable state. So it's a spinner. So once they are flying, then they're going to, the males and the females are going to be breeding in the air. And then uh, eventually towards the end of their life, the adults, the females are going to come back down to the surface, they're going to lay their eggs on the surface, and then they are going to die. Um, so um, a spent mayfly is sometimes referred to, it's, it's essentially just a, a dead adult or a dead spinner. Um, so one of the big things that you kind of want to take away from mayflies is that the, the, shape, the shape of their wing, and this is how you can tell the difference between mayflies and caddisflies and stoneflies. A mayfly, um, you can kind of see in the middle of that picture, um, uh, the, as it's sitting on the water, that wing is very upright. It's sticking almost straight up off the body. And that's kind of what um, some of our more common um, flies like a, an atoms, a parachute atoms. That's, that's what we're trying to sort of mimic with um, that hackle is be sticking straight up off of, off of the uh, thorax. And so that's how you can tell the difference between um, if you're looking at, if you're in a fly shop and you're looking at this huge collection of flies and you're not sure exactly which one, you just know you have to pick a mayfly. Um, and so you'll look for something that's got a, an upright wing um, when, you're, when you're looking at flies. And that's gonna be your mayfly. So, come on, next, okay. Hey, Mary? Yes, sir. Can I ask, at, is there a particular, um, a, a particular stage that's better or worse than the other? They are somewhat personal preference. <clears throat> they are somewhat um, what is uh, hatching on the water. Um, some of it is, uh, uh, which 
which phase of uh, their life cycle you are particularly particularly enjoy fishing sometimes um, um i don't think he's on tonight but uh mark he loves nymph fishing mark mark Curlstein. Pearl, he loves to nymph fish um so um he's probably going to pick a nymph pattern rather than a dry fly dry fly pattern he's not necessarily opposed to fishing a dry fly but if he had his preference he'd probably you know fish the fish a nymph rather than a, a dry fly so some of it's it kind of varies a little bit depending on uh, what's happening on the water how about, that, how about the time of the year i mean it, 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 is this cycle that long where you have to worry about it so early in the spring you know july time frame and then fall time frame or is this a two week three week thing I'm going to get to that a little oh, bit later. I'm sorry. I'm so, sorry. Hey, hold on, hold tight. I'm, I'm going to get there. <laughs> um, any other questions? All good? Okay. Um, so some of the more common dry flies that, um, or yeah, most of those are dry flies on that um, sort of central left uh, picture. Um, you can kind of pick out the the ones that are supposed to be mayfly imitations based on that upright wing. So in that top row, about the fourth one over, there's that little blue done. Sorry, the, the, the writing's very, very small. Um, that's definitely going to be a mayfly. Um, actually, that same row, the second one in from the left, the blue winged olive, that's definitely a mayfly. Next line down, that March Brown American, that's a mayfly imitator. Um, and uh, the Adams on uh, the third line down, starting at the left, um, those are all uh, mayfly imitators as well. On that third line, actually, the starting at the fourth one over from the left, um, those are probably going to be it's, they're referred to as down wings. So those are probably actually going to be more of a caddis pattern. The, the wing is sort of laid back over the body just a little bit more. Um, so also on this, this particular screen, we've got the up in the upper right corner, we've got um, uh, an actual, what an actual mayfly looks like. And then the picture right next to it is a fly that is meant to imitate that particular insect. So you can kind of see that, see the similarities in what they're trying to mimic um, with, a, with a, a tied fly. One other um, notable um, characteristic of mayflies is that they will have a tail. Um, and on, the, on all those flies that you see that have tails, those are also going to be um, your, your mayfly imitators, especially if they have a tail and an upright wing. Okay, so moving along to caddisflies. Um, caddisflies are have a very similar sort of life cycle. The probably the biggest difference is they have a they have an actual definitive pupa stage. So the adult will lay its eggs on the surface of the water. And then those eggs will um, kind of work their way down to the bottom and they will um, have a larval stage next. And then from that larval stage, they actually build a, 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 a case, which is referred to as a, a pupil case. Um, and that, that case is essentially intended to provide that larva um, some protection from predators in the water. Um, and it can be made from a variety of uh, materials, even, even in a soft, even if it's a soft sort of material, something like a, um, you know, some sort of, you know, little filament or something like that that's in the water or some sort of organic material, it still provides that larva enough um, protection from predators in the water that it's able to mature into a the next phase of its life which is when it's starting to emerge from its pupa it, it sort of sheds that little that little skeleton there and then works its way up to the surface 
Um, and when it's working its way up to the surface, that would be a, in the emerger stage. Um, once it gets up to the surface and actually breaks the surface of the water, then it's a, in its adult form and it will fly off and it will, um, the males and females will mate. And then the adults will, the adult female will come back down to the water and will spread her uh, eggs on, into the water and it starts all over again. So here's some examples of uh, what those different phases look like for caddis, for the caddis species. Um, over on the far left, you've got on the top line, you have the actual bug. And then on the bottom line, you've got uh, uh, some sort of a uh, tied fly that's supposed to look like it. And again, I apologize that it's sort of fuzzy. Apparently, I don't know how to size pictures very well to keep them nice and clear. I do apologize. Um, but the first, that first line is, or the first box is the larva, that larval stage without a pupa, um, that encasement attached to it. Um, that second, second column is going to be your pupa phase. Um, so you can see that, that case that's actually extending off of the back end of the hook. Um, that's intended to give that, give it that sort of uh, pupa structure that little sort of encasement that goes around the bug and you can also see that the this would actually probably be um, kind of more of an emerging pupa to be you know, more, more correct because on the on the actual fly on the bottom part of the the bottom line um, for the pupa it's you can see that it's got wings those wings aren't necessarily gonna be there when it first emerges. It's gonna be something that sort of develops as it's working its way up to the surface. Um, and then for the adult, um, you can definitely see the, bi the big difference between the caddisflies and the, and the mayflies. And you, know, the, you saw that the mayflies have that very upright wing, but for the caddisflies, their wing sort of sweeps back over their body a little bit more. Um, and that's going to be your distinguishing um, characteristic between mayflies and caddisflies. And then the uh, caddises will also go through a spent phase as well, or dead phase. Um, and they'll just be sitting on the water and, and that the fish might actually feed, be feeding on the spinners as well, or the, the spent um, dead insects. Um, probably the biggest thing between that you can tell the difference between a spent versus a live adult phase is that for the spent ones, their wings aren't going to be, you know, shaped over their back of their body or standing up straight if it's a mayfly. They're going to be splayed out horizontal because um, it's dead. So there's no, there's nothing to keep it, keep those wings upright or keep them swept back over the body. So that's why they, they always have that sort of splayed out. Uh, horizontal appearance when it's a, a spent, um, mimicking a spent insect. All right, moving along to midges or the coronamids. Um, so midges are, they're kind of defined as non-biting mosquitoes. They are, generally speaking, when they're in, a, in an adult form, they're very small and actually throughout their their life cycle um, they tend to be very small in size which is why when you are talking about midge flies they tend to be the ones that are the 20s 22s 24 size hooks tiny 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 so midges are not particularly large in size um, I think maybe a big one is maybe on a, hook, a size 18 hook. Um, so they, they do not get particularly large when they are going through their life cycle. But this, the cycle is fairly similar to um, the mayflies and the caddises. The adult's going to lay their eggs on the surface and then those eggs will actually kind of hatch and the larvae are going to work their way down to the bottom of the water and kind of burrow their way into that substrate that's you know on the on the top edge of the of the soil that's underneath the water. Um, so they'll 
burrow in there and then they will develop and eventually they will um, develop to the point where they can start working their way up to uh, the surface of the water again. And when they're working their way up to the surface of the water, they are in a pupa emerging um, state is kind of what they're referred to as. And kind of a similar sort of thing, they will eventually kind of work their way up through the water column to the surface. They will shuck their, their little uh, exoskeleton encasement that they were in, and then they will eventually fly off. And when they are in their adult form, and similar sort of thing. They will be mating in the air and then they will, the adult females will bring the eggs back down to the surface and <coughs> eggs. A lot of similarities in, in the different life cycles. So um, if, if uh, that's probably part of the reason why it's, it's uh, confusing is because it's hard to, hard to differentiate sometimes when people, sometimes when people are talking, Oh, it's a pupa or it's an emerger. Well, it's a pupa or an emerger of what? So <laughs> more information, please. <laughs> All right. So here's some examples of um, the midges that you would probably, you know, more, more commonly see being used for fly fishing. Um, you've definitely got your zebra midges. Very standard, very classic. Um, you've got some uh, on that bottom row, you've got your tungsten zebra brassy. Um, and then you've also got uh, a biop midge. You've got the WD-40s um, and midges kind of come in all shapes and sizes and colors. And some of them have tails, some of them don't. Um, it just kind of depends on what what part or what phase of their life cycle they're trying to mimic. Um, uh, the ones with the with the tails are probably you know trying to more mimic uh, uh, the pupa phase where it's it's working its way up towards the surface especially on that WD-40 and the tungsten WD-40 where it's got that little bit of I'm guessing that CDC um, feather behind the the bead head um, as to give it that appearance of wings that are starting to kind of emerge. So that would be, you know, something that's, you know, a little closer to the surface rather than real deep, deep down um, in the larval, larval phase, which um, the zebra midge is um, kind of more trying to mimic. You'll probably also notice are that... Are they attractors? Um, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to step on your tongue. Oh, no, that's okay. Uh, you know, I, I don't necessarily know that they would be strictly attractors. Um, I think they are more intended to be a bit more true to form as far as um, mimicking an actual uh, food source rather than being just something that just draws their attention. But the bead head certainly is going to draw attention because it's going to, you know, kind of give that shimmery sort of appearance as it's working its way through the water column. Um, so it's in some ways, yes, it is an attractor. In some ways, I think it's more intended to actually mimic what the fish are eating. Um, that beadhead's also going to be there to kind of keep them lower or get them down in the water column so that they are, they are very, very true subsurface flies. They are not meant to really be sitting on the surface at all. Okay, and even though we don't have too many stoneflies in uh, Arizona, I'll kind of quickly go through their life cycle. Um, stoneflies are a little different from the other categories because they actually do not have a larval or pupa stage. They actually, they don't go through that stage at all. Um, they go from adult laying the eggs, the eggs get down to the, uh, to the, the, the uh, bottom of the water, and then they go straight into a nymph stage. And generally speaking, the nymphs are kind of more crawling type of bugs. They don't necessarily have wings um, that are developing during um, their uh, nymphal stage. Um, so they tend to, you know, sort of sort of crawl their way up to the surface or they might be able to kind of you know swim their way up if they you know 
bat their abdomen enough and, and that sort of thing. Um, but once they do actually break through the surface, they are going to develop wings and then those wings will allow them to be able to take off um, and, and fly. And then they'll, they'll mate up probably, it kind of looks like they, they mate more on, um, on structures like, uh, like they, they show on this little example here of like on, on a tree limb or something like that. Um, but the males and females will mate and then the eggs will be brought back down to the water surface by the females. And there's some examples of the stoneflies in their, their primary uh, forms, nymph, adult, and spinner, or dead. Um, you definitely notice that they, they keep their legs pretty, pretty solid looking legs throughout each life phase. The nymph has legs, the adult has legs, the spinners have legs. Um, so definitely if you're, you're tying in stoneflies, you're probably going to be putting legs on them or something that's going to be a leg mimic. They also have those two pointy, um, pointy little tail, uh, tails, <laughs> sorry, can't think of exactly <laughs> what word I'm looking for, but their tails, it's a two pointy tails um, mm -hmm. off the back end of their abdomen. <laughs> yeah. Super, super technical. <laughs> All right. First time fly fishing. <laughs> Throw on everything <laughs> in the kitchen sink. <laughs> yeah, the uh, the tails that on those are usually biots, aren't they? They're really easy to tie in at the back. Usually, yeah. They're they yeah. they definitely look like they are very sturdy. My guess, I did not do not have anything to you know back this up, but I, my guess is that those uh, two tails would probably be used during the mating process. That's going to be my guess. Um, but <laughs> so, what does all this <laughs> lovely information mean? Um, does how does that help us pick a fly that we put on our on our uh, line? Well. We'll, we'll start with the dry flies and we'll kind of work our, sit at the, start with the top of the water and work our way down. So we'll talk about dry flies here first. Generally speaking, dry flies are at the end of the, end of an insect's life cycle. Um, it's their adult form. And they're from, when they're in an adult form, their purpose is to breed, bring the eggs back to the water, and then they're gonna die. That's why I call it end of life cycle. Um, so you're gonna use dry flies um, on streams and lakes. Um, and generally speaking, you're probably really only gonna use dry flies in two sort of scenarios. One, when fish are actively feeding on the surface of the water. Um, and then two, another potential use for your dry fly is when you're using it kind of as an indicator on a two fly rig, a hopper dropper rig. Um, those are the, the primary instances when I have heard of people using dry flies. Um, so when the fish are actively feeding on the surface or just below the surface, um, you can actually kind of tell what they're feeding on based off of how the fish are rising to the surface. Um, if they're tending to be a very slow kind of deliberate come to the surface and take something off, they're probably feeding on actually a mayfly. Um, if you're seeing them come to the surface and making these big splashy surface rises, but you can't see what it is that they're feeding on, well, that's probably because they're feeding on midges. And remember, midges are small. Even when they're in their adult form, they are pretty small. Um, if it's a similar sort of thing. It's big and flat, a uh, big splashy, you know, surface rise, but you can actually see what it's going after, uh, see the bug that it took. Well, that's probably a caddis fly. And then for the stone flies, um, they tend to be, from what I understand, I've actually never seen a stone fly taken on, for, uh, on the surface, so I don't know, but this is what I read. Um, it's as massive, big, slurpy rise, almost like this thing is trying to in, the fish is trying to inhale this bug. Um, so that's kind of uh, what 
if you see that sea fish going to the surface and you're trying to figure out what it is that they're feeding on, that might give you a little indicator of what to maybe try putting on your line based on how they're actually rising to the surface. Um, so how would you use them? Okay, you've got this dry fly on, how are you gonna fish it? If you're on a stream, what you're probably gonna wanna do is cast it upstream from you in those little runs and riffles in, in the, in the uh, water. And um, you're, what you're gonna probably wanna do is just let it sort of dead drift its way down the stream. And the trick with dead drifting is that you're gonna need to be able to mend your line which essentially is just a fancy way of saying, you're gonna want your, your fly line to be on the upstream side of where your fly is. So that when it's actually going through this drift in the, in the current, um, it's a natural drift. Meaning that your fly line's not dragging it downstream because it's on the downstream side and it's just pulling it straight through the water. Um, so that's kind of something that you sort of wanna try to do if you're fishing on streams. If you're fishing a dry fly on a lake, you're going to let it sit on the top of the water with your rod tip low, and you're probably going to be doing either small twitches or strips to give that fly some movement across the water. Um, in that regard, then you're probably trying to be a bit more of an attractor. You're trying to draw a fish's attention to uh, this fly that's sitting on the water. Um, and the stripping technique and your rod twitches, the purpose for doing that is to give that fly movement. Um, so it's, it's actually looking like a live bug um, that the, will draw a fish's attention and make them want to eat it. And your stripping, to, stripping and rod twitches, they, they, they can be variable. They can be slow, they could be fast, they could be you know, sort of intermittent. It just kind of depends on, on what you, what you want to try and see actually works when you're on the water. Um, so why would you use dry flies? Um, and why would you want to pick a certain kind of dry fly? If the fish are feeding on the surface, you're trying to actually, in that scenario, you're actually trying to match what that fish is eating. It's referred to as matching the hatch. Um, so that's the, that's the purpose of why you're trying to use a, a dry fly in that scenario. If you're using a dry fly as your top fly on a two fly rig, the hopper of your hopper dropper setup, um, you're, you're trying to actually offer that fish um, two options. You're giving them a buffet. <laughs> um, you're trying to give them two options um, for uh, the feeding cycle. So for example, um, you're probably gonna have a, a nymph as your lower um, fly and you have, might have a, the dry fly of that same type of insect as your top fly. So for example, if you've got a mayfly as your dry fly on the top, you might wanna have a mayfly nymph version as your dropper, the one that's actually in the bottom. So you know they're feeding on mayflies, but you're not sure if they're feeding subsurface or if they're feeding on the top. Well, you give them both options. Yeah, Any questions so far? Okay, uh, we'll move on to nymphs. So the nymphs, is, nymphs are actually the majority of a uh, fly's life. They are spending most of their time working their way up to the surface um, from the time that they uh, emerge from the, the uh, soil on the bottom. They're just kind of working their way up, working their way up, working their way up. Um, and you're going to fish um, nymphs in all waters, streams, lakes, ponds, um, drainage ditches, canals. You can, you can fish nymphs in, in all waters. Um, you're going to probably pick a nymph when you're not seeing the fish actually rise to the surface. They're not actually 
going all the way up to the surface in order to to take something so that that in and of itself is going to be an indicator that you should probably put on a nymph if you're not seeing rises probably put, put a nymph on because that's probably what they're fishing or what the fish are biting on um and the nymph is going to if you're doing that two fly rig um that's the nymph is going to be that bottom fly or an emerger is going to be your bottom fly um so why wouldn't a fish be uh going to the surface to feed um if it's daytime it's not dawn it's not dusk it's you know full full sun daytime fish are probably going to be eating um, below the surface um, because the water is cooler the lower down they are. Um, trout specifically, they, they prefer to stay in cooler water. Um, they start getting up into the warmer water and they, they don't like being up there. Um, so they're going to stick down in the cooler water. So if they're feeding, they're going to be feeding subsurface in that particular scenario. And they're also trying to stay away from um, birds uh, that would feed on them. So hawks and, and uh, some of the eagles that are around here, um, they're, they're trying to stay away out of reach of their talons. Um, so that's probably another reason why they would be not feeding on the surface, especially during the daytime. Um, a lot of your nymphs, you're going to notice that they have a bead head on them. And that purpose of that bead head is to uh, mimic that air bubble that forms around um, the head and thorax of those insects as they're working their way up towards the surface. Um, sometimes it also mimics the, the, uh, the wings as the wings are starting to develop. It's kind of a shimmery sort of um, appearance in the water. So that's sometimes what the bead head is trying to mimic as well as keeping it down lower in the water column. Some more information on nymphs. Um, if you're fishing a nymph in a, in a stream, um, you're gonna kind of do a similar sort of thing where you're gonna dead drift it downstream in the current. Um, so you're going to cast it probably upstream and let it sink. And then through stripping techniques um, or a hand twist type of slow retrieve or something like that, um, what you're doing when you're doing stripping is you're actually bringing that fly back up to the surface. So you let it sink and then you through stripping and, and or a hand twist, you're actually kind of bringing it back up through the surface and that in and of itself mimics an emerging fly or an emerging insect. Um, so that's kind of the, the idea behind um, stripping techniques when you're uh, stripping on or doing that on streams and lakes. Um, so similar sort of thing. If you're fishing it on a lake, you're gonna cast it out there. You're gonna let it kind of sink a bit um, and then you're going to start doing um, uh, stripping or the hand twist or some twitches of your rod tip to kind of give it some movement as it's trying to work its mimicking an insect trying to work its way up it, through the water column to the surface um, because they don't just go from the bottom of the water and shoot themselves up to the surface they sort of they wiggle a little bit and then they they kind of sit and sit for a moment and then they'll wiggle a little more and then they'll sit for a little bit, little bit and then they'll wiggle a little more and they'll eventually they're trying to work their way up to um, the surface of the water. Mary, um, how, how do they wiggle again? Like this. <laughs> <laughs> just like that. Just like that. <laughs> You're bad, Mike. <laughs> <laughs> it's a good thing that I cannot see myself. I am very happy about that. <laughs> I am well, sorry. You know what? <laughs> you done it's, good. It's like me trying to get up off the floor. <laughs> I wiggle a little bit and then I rest. And I no, exactly. Exactly. I think we've all been in that situation. Oh, we've been hoping yeah. to be an emerger yet. <laughs> <laughs> Ed's an emerger. Ed's an emerger. <laughs> <laughs> oh me. Oh dear. <laughs> we have digressed. <laughs> yes. Um. 
So because nymphs have uh, a bead head and they're going to sink towards the bottom, you do kind of want to be cognizant of the fact that um, if they get all the way down to the bottom or as they're sinking, they could get kind of hooked up on sub surface structures, rocks, logs, reeds, whatever. <laughs> Um, so just just know that you you might get yourself uh, hooked up on stuff that is not a fish. Uh, so we're going to be fishing emergers. Um, so what, you would want to fish an emerger, giving them that movement so that it in, it mimics that that movement that they have during that part of their life cycle. They're trying to work their way up to the surface. And if you're having, if you're pretty sure that you've got the right right sort of fly on there you've looked at the bugs that are you know underneath the rocks you've maybe even pumped a pumped a fish's stomach to you know kind of see what they've been feeding on and you're you're absolutely certain you've got the right sort of fly on there but you're still not getting any bites maybe you're trying to give that fish something that's a little bit bigger than what they've been actually feeding on so maybe go actually a size smaller in that same particular fly. Um, especially if you're fishing in some place that's been fished heavily. Um, those fish are a little smooky, a little get a little spooky of something that's really huge. It may look exactly like what they've been feeding on, but it's just way too big. And they're like, <laughs> no, that's 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 not what we're using. Um, here's just an example of um, some nymphs down here in the lower right. Um, pheasant tails, gold ribbed hare's ears, uh, zebra midges, um, all those lovely standard sort of patterns. Um, nice picture of a fish hooked on something that's got a bead head on it. Nice. Um, and then this other picture here on the left side is, uh, it's a, a nymphing rig. It's a multi, uh, multiple fly rig. This one looks like it could have possibility of three, which is definitely not okay in Arizona. Arizona's got, a, as far as I know, has a limit of two potential flies. And then you will definitely want to be making sure that the water you're fishing even allows that. Um, some some waters they might say no single single artificial lure only, um, but the general idea and the reason why I put that on there is to kind of kind of uh, show that that fly or the fly that's going to be on on the top or closest to your leader is going to be something that's non weighted. It's, it's probably not going to have a bead head. It's probably just going to be something that's going to eventually, as water absorbs into it, it's going to eventually sink down, but it's not going to sink fast. And then these lower flies, the ones that are down towards the, the tip of your, of your uh, tippet or, or whatever you've got on there, they're probably going to be some sort of uh, weighted fly. Um, so that was kind of the whole purpose of putting that on there just so that you can kind of see the idea of um, the idea behind multiple fly rigs. All right, midges, 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 midges. Midges are a little bit of the unsung heroes, I guess you could say in the fly fishing world um, because, and I say that because they can be used any time of year, all year long. Uh, because they are found in all waters, all waters, um, you know, all kinds of streams, slow, fast, ditches, lakes, ponds, um, canals, the canals around here have midges in them. Um, so they are, they are literally everywhere. Um, so if you're, not sure what to you know throw on because you're not sure what the hatch is or if there's a hatch or the the time of the year just doesn't seem like there's anything actually out and moving around throw a midge on and and you might have some luck with that um you're gonna want to 
the reason why we would want to use midges is they are a highly, highly, highly prolific aquatic insect. Um, and the fish, it, because they're always there, the fish are going to always be eating them. So if it's, if it's a time of the year where there are not some huge, wonderful buffet type of, of hatch going on, then the fish are going to revert back to their meat and potatoes. They're going to go back to what they, what they know is always in the water, which is going to be midges. Um, so probably during your winter months where um, the weather's, weather's cold and nothing's really hatching as far as insects go, you're going to want to put on a midge. Um, they are mostly subsurfaces, although there are dry fly forms. Um, your dry fly version of a midge, um, generally speaking, because these are tiny little um, flies, even in their adult form, your dry fly form isn't really going to look like any bug specifically it's because it's intended to look like a bunch of them it's intended to look like a cluster of these midges that are hatching and have gotten to the surface of the water um, so it's not necessarily going to have any distinct wings or or you know tails or anything like that it's just going to look like this big this little fluffy fluffy fly um, but that's that is the adult dry fly version the beadhead versions um, are going to be that pupa nymphal stage, the subsurface stage. Um, and like I had mentioned before, that bead is going to, you know, kind of resemble an, an air bubble that forms around the head of the insect. And um, you're going to want to let it sort of work its way down through the water column. Um, Sometimes in order to get these guys down to the bottom a little bit more readily, you might actually end up using some split shot um, so that it actually kind of gets it down into the lower parts of the water column a little bit quicker than just letting it float down on its own. Um, you're probably gonna have be using some pretty lightweight tippet because these guys are really small. These are the 20s, 22s, 24s. Um, so you're probably gonna be using something like 6X tippet um, on your leaders um, and then tying uh, that midge nymph onto that um, so that you have a slightly more delicate presentation when you're actually casting it out there. Um, you're gonna probably wanna when you're ca actually casting it, especially if you're casting in a stream, you're going to want to go into those areas where the water's not moving very fast. Um, so it's either a slow, a slow channel in between uh, big riffles, um, or it's an area that's got a, like a deep pocket um, over along uh, a shoreline. Um, and then what you're going to end up doing is actually stripping. Um, stripping that line in to, you know, kind of bring it across and up the water column again. So remember, <laughs> that's what we're doing. <laughs> okay, so here's our midges, some of the more common ones. There's a cute little trout there that's got a, got hooked on what looks like a zebra midge. Um, another little demonstration of the, of the midge life cycle, but the, these are kind of the more common midges that you're going to be seeing. Um, the zebra midges, WD-40s, um, the brassies, those are, those are all going to be, you know, good ones. Um, or I do want to draw your attention to uh, the third line down and the third one over from the left, that flasher yellow pupa. Um, you see the, the uh, what looks like probably crystal flash or something like that that's sticking out of the, the front end of the fly over the uh, eye of the hook. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably intended to um, uh, kind of mimic that air bubble. Um, so it doesn't look like that particular fly has uh, a bead on it. So it's probably going to sit a little higher 
in the water column, um, a little closer to the surface, but those, those little uh, uh, crystal flashes, those are probably intended to kind of produce that similar sort of uh, air pocket shimmery nature around the, the head of the, of the fly. Okay. I'm not really going to talk about the stoneflies because we don't really have them here in Arizona, at least not a lot of them. Um, so I don't necessarily have a whole lot of information on how to fish them here in the state. Um, but I do want to talk about streamers um, because we do use a lot of streamers. Um, so streamers are intended to mimic a bait fish. Um, and essentially a bait fish is a smaller fish. <laughs> um, you're going to be using uh, streamers in lakes and streams. Um, they're not necessarily likely to be used in a two fly rig unless it's a very small version, um, meaning on a smaller hook. Um, because the, they are intended to be under the surface. So most of your streamers are pretty good size and you would have to have something much larger sitting on the surface in order to uh, not be dragged down by the weight of that streamer that would be sitting underneath it, which is why I say it's unlikely to use them in a two fly rig. Um, they're, so they're usually fished on their own. Um, you definitely want to be giving these flies movement um, when you are fishing them because the idea is to, they usually have a lot of feathers on them, like for example, are woolly buggers. Woolly buggers are a streamer. They are a bait fish mimic. They've got all that marabou feathers that when you actually pull it through the water and your paw in that pausing, when you, as you're pulling, you pull, pause, pull, pause. Um, during that pause, those feathers are gonna kind of go back to their, their sort of natural state. So it gives it a lot of motion as it's going through the water. And that motion is going to attract fish to come and take a look at it and hopefully take a chomp out of it too. Um, it kind of depends on the- Bunny leech. Yeah, bunny leeches. Yeah, bunny leeches too. Um, anything that's kind of, you know, kind of have a lot of, lot of fluff and a lot of movement to it is, is probably going to work well as a, as a streamer. Um, if you're fishing, I did read that, I read that if you were fishing cold or dirty water, um, you're probably going to want your retrieve or your stripping to be a little slower, um, probably so that the fish can actually see it a little bit better. Um, but then if you're in clear water, um, and normal, you know, trout water temperatures, you're probably going to want to have a faster stripping or a faster retrieve, um, just because the fish are not feeling sluggish because of the cold water and they can see normally. So that's kind of the idea behind that. Um, I all did also kind of see this, you know, uh, tip, we'll call it a tip because it could be argued the opposite way, that if you're fish in dirty, you know, kind of dirty or cloudy water, you're probably going to want something, a streamer that's darker in color. Um, and if you're fishing clearer water, you're going to want to fish something that's lighter in color. Um, so if you're fishing like a bunny leech and nice clear waters, you probably might want a, a, a white one or something that's fairly light colored. Um, so again, debatable. Some people would say yes, some people would say no. Um, I'm sure it actually probably goes both ways. It just kind of depends on what's catching a fish's attention. Um, we use streamers because they are intended to mimic a smaller fish and the bigger fish eat the smaller fish. Um, so that's the reason why we use them and they have one reason why they are effective. Um, but they also have that motion of the materials that are used to tie them and that motion draws a fish's attention. Um, so that's kind of part of the reason why we would use them too. Uh, the more common patterns for streamers, especially ones that you've probably heard 
um, being used in Arizona. Um, claws are minnows, uh, zonkers, which is, so zonkers are made out of a, a rabbit fur that are cut in strips. So they have a lot of movement when you're moving it through the water. Bucktails, leeches, marabou leeches, bunny leeches, woolly buggers, um, and the ones that are probably gonna be more common for lakes and streams um, is gonna be probably everything from up that clouds are minnow and down on that list. Um, I think the deceivers, it looks like the deceivers are more intended to be saltwater for saltwater fishing. Um, that bottom right hand uh, uh, picture is kind of, you know, different ways you can cast a streamer. Um, you can either cast it straight across from you um, and kind of bring it across the, the current. Um, you can do sort of slightly downstream from you and then you're just stripping it in. So it's trying to kind of work its way across. Remember, this is supposed to imitate a fish. So the fish can swim against the current. Um, so that's the reason why you would, you would probably fish them more this way um, rather than just throwing it upstream and then letting the current take it down. All right, terrestrials. I classify terrestrials as anything that's not supposed to be in the water. Kind, kind, of, kind of true. Um, <laughs> Coco, <laughs> not supposed to be in the water. <laughs> um, so you're going to be using your terrestrials on streams and lakes, primarily probably during the spring, summer, and early fall when um, your land insects are more active. <laughs> um, and also when your uh, aquatic uh, insect hatches are kind of slowing down a little bit. Um, so that in the water food source is dwindling out a little bit. So the fish might be looking for those nice juicy bugs that are falling off of trees or getting blown into the water that make lovely little lunchtime snacks. Um, high days that are, you know, really windy, you're probably going to see more, more of these terrestrials in the water. So terrestrials are things like that makes sense. Beetles, ants, um, hoppers. Um, see, anybody else? Anybody else got anything? Those are the only three I'm thinking of right now. Mice. Um, mice. Thank you. Caterpillar. Caterpillar. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so cicadas. I'll, cicadas. Yes, cicadas. Definitely. Um, and those are actually probably one of the one of the few terrestrials that. Um, when they are hatching, because they do actually hatch, um, the fish love them, go crazy <laughs> for them in the waters where you actually have cicada hatches. I'm thinking the Green River in Utah. Um, I would love to see oh. that. That would be so cool. Um, <laughs> and so why are the fish going after these, these bugs that are not supposed to be in the water? Well, they're a nice, big, juicy meal. They're kind of like throwing a steak out. Um, it's a big protein source. It's an energy source. Um, so it can tide that fish over for a while. Um, so that's why the fish will go after them. If you're using them in streams, you're going to cast. be wanting to try to cast along the, the bank. Um, or if you've got some sort of a, uh, an undercut where the, the, the stream is actually uh, washed away some of the some of the, uh, the the soil along the bank and there's actually like a little pocket in there it's a great place for fish to hide especially nice big fish um, so if you want to entice some of those big boys out you need to entice them with something that's going to make it worth their while to move um, so um, well, but also along, if there's any structure that's actually in the water, like logs and reeds, it's probably a good idea to try to, you know, cast towards those areas too. Um, and then you're going to do either a free drift um, or with some small twitches, or you're going to do uh, uh, 
some end of they call it end of drift erratic twitches. I think the idea is that you're trying to mimic this bug as it's struggling to be in the water because it's not supposed to be in the water and it's after a while it's gonna you know be trying to get out. Um, so those you know kind of fast fast moving twitches will definitely kind of bring bring some attention to it. If you're going in lakes with these guys, um, similar sort of thing. You're going to want to pass along the shore, reeds, rocks, logs, and a very similar sort of, you know, method. Start, you start with some small twitches because this thing is like, okay, kind of, this bug's trying to figure out where, where it's at now. And then as the longer it's in there, it's going to start moving a little bit more erratically. All right, so here are some of the more common ones um, here on the left. Uh, we've got some ants in there. We've got some, uh, what looks like a beetle with that little orange dot on the top of him, the black foamy one. Um, we've got a couple versions of hoppers. Um, yeah, super, super effective. Um, Generally speaking, these guys are intended to stay on the surface. So they're going to be made out of things like foam um, that floats, or they're going to have a fair amount of hackle on them in order to try to keep them more towards the surface. Um, they're going to have deer hair. The deer hair is going to keep them, you know, more towards the surface. Um, so those are kind of the materials that you'll, you'll see in these particular flies. And that little graph up in the uh, right upper right corner is kind of the times of the year when you might actually see these guys in um, in in the water or you know being around the water mostly during summer and fall months just to kind of keep it keep that in mind um, if you're trying to use an ant in January that fish might think that that's a little odd all right Cast the darn thing for crying out loud. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's talk about some of those some of those possibilities for uh, uh, fishing these things. The hopper dropper, the two fly rig. Um, my personal nemesis. I get tangled up so badly with hopper dropper rigs, but they are effective if you can actually get them to lay out on the water well um the, again the top fly or is in generally speaking going to be a dry fly with a nymph or an emerger or a, a midge or a pupa or something like that roughly about 18 inches below but that can be variable depending on uh, the depth of the water that you're in or that you're fishing um the dry that dry fly does need to be big enough quote unquote buoyant enough to not get pulled under by that lower fly so generally speaking that lower fly is going to be something that's probably smaller in size mm -hmm. and it does need to be able to sink kind of quickly um especially if you're if you're uh, fishing streams with them um it's it's a pretty pretty rough thing when your your dry fly on the top is uh, surpassed because the currents dragged it further downstream than the the lower fly that's supposed to be sinking. Um, so that's something to kind of hey, here. Yes. Um, that top fly it's gonna Im it's intended to sort of imitate the adult form of the same fly that's on the bottom. So we kind of talked about this briefly before where um, it's, it's the same sort of fly, whether that be a mayfly or a caddisfly or a midge, mm -hmm. um, but it is the, the nymphal form or the emerger form of that dry fly that's on top. Um, you can also, uh, some of the ideology behind the two fly rig is that that top fly is meant to be an attractor. Um, so something like a uh, royal wolf or a uh, royal coachman or something that doesn't necessarily um, 
isn't necessarily a specific fly pad or you know an insect pattern, but it's meant to draw the fish's attention. And then, but generally speaking, it draws the fish's attention, but then most of the time they actually get hooked up, hooked up on the, and go after the, the smaller fly on the bottom, the nymph fly. Um, so one just kind of says, hey, I'm over here. And then they see what's actually kind of food um, and they'll, they'll take that one, the bottom fly actually. Um, and sometimes people will use a two fly rig they're not actually intending to um, catch a fish on that top fly. They're actually intending to use that top fly more as an indicator. Um, and what they're, what they're actually gonna try and catch the fish on is that nymph or the lower fly. Um, but it, it's, it serves as a useful indicator um, for when you actually have a strike on that lower fly. Any questions yet? Thoughts, joys, concerns? Nope, you're doing good. Okay. Um, so some of the other things that you want to kind of keep in mind are um, the time of year that you're out on the water. Is it spawning season? Um, or what are the hatches that are, are going that are going on? Um, are those hatches something that's considered cyclical by by years like the cicadas? Um, cicadas don't necessarily hatch every year. They, they are every, was it, has anybody ever seen a cicada hatch or know much about them? Because I don't know too much about cicadas. I just know they're sort of cyclical. Anybody? Make lots of noise. <laughs> lots of noise, all right. <laughs> lots of noise. Excellent. Yeah. <laughs> noise. And, and they, they are around. large, they're <laughs> large and ugly. <laughs> and they live inside my head. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Um, where you're fishing is also going to be um, something that you're going to want to take into consideration. Um, if you're fishing lakes and streams in the upper Midwest, um, Minnesota, Michigan, um, mayfly hatches are generally speaking late spring, early summer. Um, I remember going fishing up in uh, northern Minnesota on a lake. Um, up oh. there. Uh, it was it was lovely. This is it was it was a nice time of year, um, but we were up there early early summer after just after school had let out and um, walleye is 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 the big thing that you go fishing for up there, and we could not catch a single walleye because the walleyes had just gorged themselves on a mayfly hatch that had just finished up. So we were having a heck of a time trying to catch anything um, because the walleye just were, they weren't hungry anymore. They were full. Um, so um, that is definitely something to kind of keep in mind um, when, you're, uh, when you're going fishing um, in some, of, some areas. And um, uh, if you're going after steelhead or uh, in, in areas that have steelhead, the, the stonefly hatches are gonna be important to you. Um, the Green River in, in Utah, for example, they've got that, that cicada hatch that generally speaking happens late May, early June. Um, and or that you know varies from a little bit based on the year. Um, but that is you know something that you kind of want to keep in mind, especially if you're if you're going somewhere specific for a specific kind of fishing with a specific kind of hatch in mind. Um, if you happen to be going and trying to go salmon fishing up in Alaska, to be honest, uh, uh, in Alaska, it, it doesn't matter exactly what's hatching because at that point in time, when the salmon are going back upstream to lay their eggs and to, to mate, they aren't feeding. Um, they are just trying to get upstream. So as long as you get that hook close enough to that fish's mouth, um, is, and you, it actually sets in their mouth and you don't foul hook them on a fin or, you know, some other part of their body, then you, that's pretty much how you're going to catch salmon up in, uh, Alaska. You've um, got to make them, you got to make them angry. You got to hit them <laughs> right in the head. 
Yeah. <laughs> Hit him with a howitzer. <laughs> yeah. I got to tell you, I, I, fished, I fished the uh, Rogue River a couple, two or three times up uh, where it comes into the Pacific. And I've had my fair share of some huge fish, but you've got to make them angry. They don't want to bite. Yeah. Yeah. Their, their mind is not on feeding. Their mind is on something else. <laughs> um, okay. So we're talking about these hatch, hatch charts. Um, every area, every river has um, hatch charts that have been figured out for those, for that water. And they can be found online through state fishing game um, resources and, and that sort of thing. Or just doing, you could just do a general Google search of uh, the Wind River, Wyoming, hatch chart. And you'll probably get um, some something will pop up. Um, when you're reading this, these hatch charts, what you're looking for is, generally speaking, the time of year when... Um, these particular flies would be effective. So if you're looking for mayflies in Rocky Mountains, well, um, you're, you've got some possibilities that like they, they have listed on here. Um, blue wing olives are gonna be good for kind of the more late fall, winter, early spring months. And then, um, Generally speaking, your blue wing olives are going to be a little less effective during your summer months, but then you might want to try a green drake um, or a pale morning dun or something like that. Similar thing with the caddisflies. Um, if you, but generally speaking, your caddisflies they they have a pretty, pretty solid, you know, early spring to early early mid fall where they're likely to be um, out and hatching. And then you've got a possibility of a, a couple different varieties that you could maybe try to put on your line and, and get some, some action off of. Um, streamers all year long, same with, and you'll notice that top line, midges all year long. Um, and then um, stone flies are very, very sort of small time frame, very specific for uh, Rocky Mountains and that sort of thing. Um, some of them, some pattern or some hatch charts will actually give you like way over on the right side of that chart. It mentions sizes. So that's definitely something that's useful too. All right. Okay, some random theories. <laughs> And again, random theories are debatable. So uh, I'm, I'm sure what's been written down here, um, other people have had success the other way. Um, but I'm sure some of us have heard that saying of, if you're, depending on what's, what the cloud conditions are in the sky, if you've got a light sky, you're gonna go wanna go with a light fly. Dark sky, dark fly. Um, the, whether or not this is always true, um, sometimes it'll probably, I'm sure it probably works often enough that it's, it's the saying is still hanging around. So I would imagine there's some truth to it. Um, purple, who's heard of, you know, purple being like the go-to color for flies. I, I know I've certainly heard that. Um, well, there's actually a little bit of truth behind that. And a, uh, Dr. Robert Benke, he wrote a, a, a paper or a book on trout and salmon. And he found that the, the retinas of a trout's eye are more receptive to the blue spectrum and the color. Um, so purples are definitely in, within that, uh, that spectrum. So that's probably why maybe fish are just able to see purple flies a little bit uh, more effectively. And that's why they might hit on purple a little bit more, more often. Um, water conditions is probably, you know, something that you, you do want to kind of keep in mind. Um, if, especially if it's, you know, clear water or dirty or muddy water. Um, some, if it's muddy water, one of the things you kind of want to maybe keep in mind is that you might want to try a larger fly or a fly that's got a little bit more, that's a little bit brighter in color. Um, or a fly that sort of contrasts that 
low light that's in muddy water. Um, just in order, and all these are in order to try to give your fly a little bit more visibility so that the fish can see it a little bit better. Um, something that's a larger gives it a better silhouette so that it looks like something that a fish might want to go after. A brighter fly maybe gives more contrast um, in the water. Um, they mention bright, bright flies with uh, fluorescent colors and maybe it's got that fluorescent color has got a shorter UV ultraviolet, ultraviolet wavelength so that the fish can see it a little bit better. Um, and then if you want to try to do something that's sort of contrasting, a contrasting fly in, in low light or muddy water, you might want to try something that um, that's either black or, or red because it, it just kind of gives it a different silhouette when you've got a certain color some something something that just makes it a little bit more visible on the water is essentially what you're trying to do in this scenario. Um, one thing that you do kind of want to be a little careful of, especially if you're if you're uh, casting something that's uh, big and bright, is you want to make sure that you've got a good cast, that it doesn't just flop and splash on the water because you might just have just scared your fish away. Um, so you do want to be a little bit more careful with your cast that it lays out on the water a little bit um, with a bit more finesse. Okay, almost done. Um, this is a list of the more common flies that you'll see used in Arizona. Um, the uh, Everything that's in yellow is an actual name of a fly. And then what's in white is um, the type of fly that it is intended to mimic. So for our dry flies, if it's a mayfly that you're trying to, you know, fish, you might want to go with a blue wing olive or a pale morning dun or a parachute atoms. If it's a caddis dry fly, you might want to go with an elk hair caddis or a triple wing caddis or a CDC caddis or something like that. Um, Stoneflies, that uh, golden sofa, sofa pillow squala. Not even sure what that looks like, um, but you know that's an actual name of a fly that it mimics a stonefly um, that apparently can be effective in Arizona. Um, Ed had mentioned Ed, you had mentioned the the attractors earlier. Um, so attractors and stimulators. The theory behind attractors and stimulators is that um, you're either trying to draw a fish's attention to the fly or you're trying to piss them off. <laughs> and, and there's actually flies that fit in that scenario. <laughs> As an attractor, you've got your royal wolf, your yellow humpies, um, your renegades uh, type of fly, all dry flies. Um, so they'll be sitting on the surface, but they're intended to look close enough like food that it brings a fish's attention to it. If it's a stimulator and you're just trying to piss them off, um, it's just, you know, intended to be something sort of foreign and weird looking that makes a fish almost want to try to drive that thing off of the water. Um, and in so doing, they might try to eat it. Okay. Um, goofus bug, Something with uh, orange or yellow bodies. Um, there's a whole array of them. Um, for the nymphs, if it's mayfly, BH means beadhead. Um, so a beadhead bird's nest, a beadhead hares, a beadhead pheasant tail, a beadhead copper john. Um, if it's a caddis, gold ribbed hares ears are very popular. Um, beadhead gold ribbed hare's ears, uh, another version of that. Um, sparkle pupa, um, they're, they're effective as well. And then um, some other nymphs that are not necessarily within what we kind of talked about. Um, nymph meaning strictly that it's a subsurface fly. Um, Betis patterns. Betis is kind of a whole another area that I need to do a lot more research on to understand betas patterns. Um, San Juan worms, egg patterns, prince nymphs, 
our lovely Arizona peacock ladies, um, that sort of thing. Those are all, all effective nymph patterns. For the chronomids or the midges, like I had mentioned before, um, we're trying to, if it's a dry fly midge, we're just trying to look like a bunch of them in a mass. So your Griffith snap is your quintessential uh, midge dry fly. I don't necessarily know of any others that would mimic a midge dry fly other than a Griffith gnat. Um, but for your um, nymphs and your emergers, then we've got a whole list of them. rs snow cones, zebra midges, black beauties, uh, brassies, um, you name it. You, we, we may have even tied a few of these. Um, for streamers, those ones that are trying to mimic the bait fish, Woolly buggers, bunny leeches, semi-seal leeches, clouser minnows, crawfish, um, muddler minnows. Um, those are kind of the more common ones that you're going to see in Arizona. And then for the terrestrials, it's the ants, hoppers, beetles, cicadas, mouse, anything with rubber legs. <laughs> the reason why the rubber legs are important is because it provides a lot of motion and the trout just kind of key in on that motion and they'll, they'll tend to you know, want, maybe want to go after it. Okay, this is where I got all my information. The most important one is the top one. Better fishermen than me. That's where a lot of this information came from. Um, so definitely uh, lean on the lean on the people around you um, for any questions. It's always I, I have yet to find a fisher a uh, fly fisherman that isn't willing to willing to be giving giving of their information um and but there are also some you know little books and things and of course websites that can be useful i don't know norm's pretty tight-lipped <laughs> <laughs> is that before or after coffee <laughs> <laughs> who wouldn't want to fish there holy cow oh, not me <laughs> Jeez. Not me either where is it mary I have absolutely no idea. I saw that and I was like, huh, I don't care. I just want to go there. <laughs> it's like the bluebells of Colorado. Yeah, or something. Something. Canada, it'd be. Yeah, maybe Canada. That's pretty yeah. blue water for it to be uh, anything other than yeah. uh, maybe snow fed. Yeah, Beautiful. that looks like glacier melt. Right? Yeah. Glacier, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's why I said Canada. Or uh, yeah. Alaska. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, you can see the glacier. <laughs> or what looks like glacier there. Way yep. in the back. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I asked to have a, that presentation you did so I can have that filed. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I can. Put I in, can my, uh, in the chat to you, my email address and everything. Okay. Yep, I can definitely, if anybody wants this for the references, we can we can get it emailed out to you. Dynamite. Thanks, Murray. All right. And I thought this was always a, was a lovely little quote. Many men go fishing all their lives without knowing it is not fish they are after. A row never knew me. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> all right, everybody. That's all I got. Mary, uh, before you Next run away... Time, Excellent, excellent, super, super great job. Thank you very okay. much. I definitely hope it was useful information to everybody. Sure yeah. was. Yeah. So much information. <laughs> yeah, a lot of information. <laughs> a lot of information. Could probably have spread that out actually into two talks, to be honest. Probably could. Yeah, no doubt. Yes. Good. Very good, Mary. Thank you, Mary. You are welcome. What's in the white cup, Mary? Coffee. Coffee. Thanks, Mary. <laughs> Soon oh, to be honey, replaced by you. something else. <laughs> Thank you very much, Mary. You did you a good welcome. job. You are Tony, welcome. glad you could make it eventually. <laughs> yeah, I, I had a, a surprise party that I was surprised upon, but it wasn't. <laughs> Party for somebody else, but they sprung it on me at the last minute. <laughs> yep. That's okay. You made it. You made it. Yep. All right. Has I made it last year too. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. 
Hey, Rich. Any questions or comments, anybody? Hey, Rich. Yeah. Can we please name this the Wiggle episode? Stop <laughs> <laughs> wiggling. Well, I, I can tell you that we've been recording the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, and that segment will be on sale. For sale-off. your viewing pleasure. <laughs> In all its wiggling glory. Yeah. Yes, indeed. You're not going to live that one down, Mary. <laughs> That's all right. That's all right. Good job. Good job. Yeah, excellent. Yeah. All right, if there are any questions or comments, it's it's already after 9 o'clock. Oh, my gosh. I'm sorry. Time, I'm, so, uh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yeah. Um, Don't be, Mary. It was worth it. Okay. Oh, yeah. No, it was. Hey, I didn't sleep at all. Oh, everybody's eyes are open. Me neither. <laughs> you know, sometimes these things can be a little dry, my own included. So oh, uh, I get it. Uh, again, keep an eye on your email. Look for the um, the invitations that'll be coming out probably in the next week for some of these uh, fishing events as soon as we can get them kind of pinned down. And then, uh, you know, we'll get the invitations out there. Can't stress enough, first come, first serve, okay? And uh, I'm hoping that we have a real good turnout on these and we can uh, all get out and go fishing together. Wouldn't that be sweet? Yeah. I think we're all ready. (laughs) And to all a good night. (laughs) Okay. Good night, Bill. Thanks for joining us. I know it's a lot later for you than it is for us. So uh, safe travels, and we'll see you soon. Bye, Bill. See ya. Good night, everybody. Night. Night. Bye, Bye. Bye.